You are the resurrected one, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, we praise your name, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you. We praise your holy name. We praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everyone in this house tonight, why don't we stand together and just begin to worship Him? We praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise your name, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise you. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
desire in all of our heart, Lord. And Lord, you alone deserve all glory. Lord, you are so worth loving. I want to tell you tonight that if you've never really experienced unconditional love, only through Jesus, only through Jesus can you get that. Hallelujah, Jesus. It was the Heavenly Father's plan to redeem us. receive Jesus, not only do you get to experience that awesome love, but you become part of the family of God.
none greater, none higher, none above you, Jesus. on our hearts and you know fully well how much we love you but we cannot see into the depths of your heart and realize how much you love us because you love us far beyond any amount of love that we have for you Father I pray that we would come to the place of understanding your love and knowing it more completely than we ever have. Because in your word, that's what you said you'd like, that you desire, that you want us to know your love. Father, all too often we judge your love by what we see in this world. But your love is not governed by what happens in this world because what happens in this world does not fall back on your shoulders. But you love us enough that you've made a way for us to escape this world. And the day is coming that even though we live here now, Jesus is returning and this world is going to be changed forever and ever and ever. Father, you love this world so much. You leave us here so that we can do our part to impact this world on behalf of Jesus Christ. May we be that influence you desire. Tonight, Father, minister to us, those here, those watching and listening. Minister to us out of the fullness of your love to bring about your will this night. Jesus, we give you the praise. We thank you. We call it done in your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, go ahead and spread the love. Hallelujah. You know, most pastors would be very concerned if they saw the majority of the congregation back by the door (laughs) before the sermon, and especially before the offering. (laughs) My goodness. For those of you who are watching this, 
I appreciate your attention. Because <laughs> most of the people here have no idea I'm even talking. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Well, again, yeah, Thanksgiving's two weeks away. Th Thanksgiving is two weeks away. Why didn't somebody tell me? <laughs> that, that means that two weeks from tonight, we won't be having a Wednesday night service. That's got to be so discouraging for you. So disappointing. Oh, the, there's Kleenex for you to wipe your tears. <laughs> And then, uh, wow, it'll be just, what, a week and a half after that, our Christmas banquet? Yep. Yeah, gee whiz. It's that time of year again. You know what? Last week, I found a radio station that's already playing nothing but Christmas music. 93.3. .3. And you know what? I enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, Anyway, praise God. You know, I, I really, I pray that this will be the greatest Christmas for you ever. You may hear me say that more than once, but I mean it. Not just, you know, oh, that's great, Christmas Day, the family was together. I mean the entire season. You know, when you turn the radio on and listen to the songs, I don't care if it's Jingle Bells or Oh Holy Night, may you have the greatest Christmas season you've ever had. And just... May it just seem like the season is longer than what it really is that you experience so much joy. And, and I mean that. They're just, I don't know. To me, there's something really special about Christmas. And I enjoy it. Praise God. So let's see here. Anything else? Um, I'll say this now, and you'll hear me say more about it in the future. Uh, you know, what happened down there in Sutherland, Texas was terrible. Absolutely horrible. And um, I actually have contacted the, uh, both the FBI and Beaver Creek Police about doing an assessment here, you know, as far as just, I mean, it's not like this is a complicated facility. But anyway, uh, just, do, just talking to them about what they think concerning the threat possibilities in this area which there's no way to really predict anything like that. But anyway, I guess what I'm saying is I don't want you to think that I'm dismissing what happened, that I'm being as proactive as I possibly can at this point. So um, I'll keep you updated. In fact, I'm going to be meeting with one of the captains from the Beaver Creek Police Department. So I'll keep you guys updated as time goes on just to let you know. And I mean, quite frankly, I have no fear. I really don't. No fear at all. But at the same time, as the pastor, you know, you have to take things into consideration. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll just praise God, keep trusting him, and um, go forward from there. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you please turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. When I was growing up, I don't know that I heard, well, you know, it has been a long time, really. And I don't, I don't say that as a joke, but I really don't remember everything I heard growing up in church, but I grew up in church. I mean, like I've told you before, every time the doors were open, we were there. Well, I don't remember everything that I was taught in Sunday school or training union or Wednesday night classes or the regular church services. But I don't remember hearing a lot about our position as Christians as it pertains to sin. And well, I'm really not even sin, but just, you know, problems in life. I'm sure there was teaching about it, but I just don't know that it was everything it could have been or should have been. And there's a lot of wrong teaching that's out there, uh, as you know. 
The book of Romans is a powerful book, an extremely powerful book. Uh, some of the, I guess you might say, experts have said that the book of Romans is written like a legal treatise or, you know, legal document, just the way Paul wrote it. And he was extremely educated. But nevertheless, we're going to jump into chapter 8, begin in verse 1. And before we do this, you know, I just want to repeat something that I've said many times over the years, and that is, the more you find out who you are in Christ, the more you realize you don't have any excuses. You just don't. When you see the way God describes a Christian in the New Testament, that's because it really is that way. He doesn't just put things in here. I, mean, I don't know. It's, it's kind of like, it's almost like we uh, like detach ourselves from what we read. And we read it, but we don't understand that it's really God speaking to us and in, in many ways describing us, who we're supposed to be, what we are, what we can do. It's almost like we read the Bible and we think, yeah, praise God, that's the Bible. But I live today. 2,000 years later, I'm not living back then. Okay, I understand that. Uh, same here. <laughs> I'm living 2,000 years later, not living back then. But at what point was there a shift? Meaning, when did it change? And if it did change... Where's the rest of the Bible telling me about the change? In other words, if this is still the same, then it's relative to me today. I need to get a hold of that. I need to realize that this is God saying, here's who you are. Here's what you can do. And here's what you can not do. So we pick this up here in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, where he says there's no condemnation, that doesn't mean there will never be conviction when you do wrong. But he means there's no condemnation. Now, very briefly, the law was a condemning sentence. Because what it did was reveal to humanity, and really primarily the Jewish nation, it revealed to them, you're a messed up people. And not just you, but all of humanity. Here's the way it's supposed to be, and you can't do this. Because you've got a problem on the inside. Well, he says here in, in chapter 8, verse 1, that, you know what, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're one with him, you're, you know, in Christ Jesus. Well, there's no more condemnation. Meaning, in Christ, you have fulfilled the law. And he said, um, the idea is that you're going, you will not be walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, that's not the Holy Spirit. That is who you've become in Christ. Your born-again Spirit. He says, there's no condemnation, no condemning sentence, or another way to say it, no eternally con condemning sentence damnation sentence on you if you're in Christ Jesus and living according to who you become in him and not living according to the flesh. So then he's telling me right here that I don't have to live according to the flesh. Well, he takes this a step further than in the next verse and says, let me explain why this is true. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, what is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? Well, that's not the Holy Ghost of life. That's talking about my born-again spirit, which is life. So the born-again spirit of life, the law, uh, what is the law of the spirit of life? Well, the law of the spirit of life, in, briefly, means that you've been set free from the law of sin and death. Well, what is the law of sin and death? Well, again, got to be brief, but the law of sin and death it was a, um, 
a way of describing being lost, not being born again, and the law associated with the lost condition said, well, you can't go to heaven. You go to hell. And you don't have a choice in the matter unless you accept Jesus Christ. You can't change yourself. But the law of the spirit of life says, you are no longer a part of the law of sin and death. Now, let me personalize it. I, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, I've set you free. I have set you free from the law of sin and death. You're no, no longer bound to it anymore. Because, verse 3, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemns sin in the flesh. So he's saying, you could obey the law, but the law, he's talking here the law of Moses. He said, you could obey the law, but the law couldn't change you on the inside. And the reason it couldn't was because it was weak through the flesh. In other words, it was the flesh, your fleshly efforts to keep the law. Well, you were, you were weak in the flesh, meaning your flesh was too weak to become what God desired you to become. So... God recognizing this situation, he sent his own son, he says, in the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning he was not born of sinful flesh. Well, how do you get born of sinful flesh? By having an earthly father. That's how you're born of sinful flesh. And so he sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and he sent his son for sin. In other words, the reason I'm sending my son it's because you guys have a massive sin problem down there. And some of you are so blind you can't see it. But I'm going to send my son down there for sin to deal with this. And so Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. How did he condemn sin in the flesh? Here's a way. The Bible tells us in another place that Jesus was tempted like as we are in every way you can think yet without sin. Meaning, as sin approached him and said, hey, you know what? You got a flesh body like everybody else. So why don't you do this? Hey, you know what? You've got emotions like everybody else. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? See that girl over there? She's looking at you. <laughs> don't you think you'd like to? And Jesus just said, no, no, no. And by continually saying no, he was condemning sin in a flesh body. Okay, now let me just jump ahead for a moment here. If I am no longer bound by the sin nature, and I am in Christ, and the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death, do you realize that according to the pattern of Jesus, I now can condemn sin in the flesh? Because, see, the, the temptations are still out there. We probably all faced a bunch of them today. The temptations are still out there. However, I now am like Christ. I'm born again. I have his life, his nature in me. And because of that, I can condemn sin in the flesh. I can say no, no, and no. I will not only not do that, but I will not think that I'd like to do that. I will not allow my thoughts to desire to do that. And he says, now the reason that Jesus did this, this condemning of sin in the flesh, is so, verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So he's saying the righteousness that was revealed by the law that nobody could attain to because they were trying to attain to it outwardly by flesh efforts. He said through Jesus Christ, that righteousness can be fulfilled in you because you're no longer walking in the flesh. You're living according to who you become in Jesus Christ. You're walking after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. 
Now, what he's, what he's saying here, and, and before I go any further, yes, this is a quick sprint through Romans chapter 8. What he's saying here, they that are after the flesh. Well, what does that mean, they that are after the flesh? Okay, if you're lost, if you're not born again, then that which goes on inside of you cannot fully connect with the life and nature of God or the life and nature of a born-again spirit. And so therefore, what is in you will be geared toward the things of the flesh. Even though we know that lost people, you know, you can take a lost person who uh, has, you know, they were an alcoholic. Well, then they quit drinking. Well, that's wonderful. Praise God. But they may live the rest of their life desiring a drink. I mean, it's different for every person. But see, in Jesus Christ, there's total freedom. I mean, there's, there's freedom to the point. See, there's nothing in your born-again spirit that wants to sin. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because your born-again spirit was born, birthed, delivered, imparted, created in you by God himself out of his own righteousness and true holiness. That's why, see, no Christian, you can't say, I can't help it. You can't say, well, you know, it's just the way I am. No, it, well, then you need to get born again, because if that's how you are, you're not born again. Because somebody who's born again, listen, you do not have the desire to do those things in your spirit. But you can override your spirit by yielding to the flesh. We'll see this here in a moment. He says, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So now that I'm born again, and I have God's life and nature on the inside of me, I have the potential to live according to those things which pertain to the born-again Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Meaning, if your mindset, if your life set is geared toward the, uh, the things of the flesh, sin, you're lost, whatever. He said, you need to understand you're going to die. Now, he's not simply talking here uh, physical death. Everybody dies physically. He's talking about spiritual death. What is spiritual death? Eternal separation from God. Dying in a lost, sinful condition. And he says, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, now, see, God right here is describing, here's how it's supposed to be for you as a Christian, you're supposed to understand this life that you have in you. And not only that, you're supposed to be living in the peace of that life. Not simply the peace that, well, you know what, a lot of Christians, they struggle believing that God loves them. Well, where's the peace in that? Now, see, when you understand that you're born again, when you truly understand what happened to you when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? There is a peace in you that cannot be shaken no matter what. Oh, it doesn't mean that you won't go through times being upset or angry about this or that, you know, whatever. No, he's talking about what's happening on the inside of you. And you're going to comprehend the power of that life. You're going to know, look, I belong to God. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And, okay, the world stinks. It's a lousy place. Bad things keep happening, and more bad things are happening. But you know what? <laughs> That's not going to rattle me. I'm not going to be afraid. The fear will not be my governor. Peace will guard my heart. And he says here in verse 7, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now very briefly, it is impossible for a lost purpose person to truly think the way that a born-again person can think because you don't have anything in you that's compatible with the Spirit of God. You know, over in uh, Romans chapter 12, it talks about being transformed by the uh, renewing of your mind. All right, well, see, your mind cannot be renewed to the things of God if you're lost. You have to have that born-again life on the inside of you or the, the spirit, as he's talking about here. You have to have that new nature on the inside of you so that you can begin to think parallel to or in line with God 
his word, his life, his nature and character. And he says here, so then, verse 8, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, get this straight. You've got a lot of people who are going to stand before God. Now, all right, let me back up a little bit. You know how we talk about, you know, well, when people stand before God, here's what they're going to do and here's what they're going. Truth be known, I don't know what people are going to do. I don't know what it's going to be like when born again people are standing before God. I don't know what it's going to be like when lost people stand before God. So let me just throw this out. <laughs> you know, Jesus said there are going to be some people look at me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this? Didn't I do that? Didn't I? And you say, hey, you know what? Depart from me because you guys messed up big time. That's the Jim Martin version. <laughs> but notice this. He says, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. All right. Now, what that means is if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It does not matter how many good things you do. You cannot be at that place of truly pleasing God because you're not his child. Now, you can stand before him and say, but God, you know, I, I gave a whole lot of money to the church. And he might say, yes, you did. And I appreciate that because the church used that to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you rejected that gospel. And, you know, here are a lot of people that are everyday living. You know, look in the newspaper, look at the obituaries. You know, so-and-so went to be with God. Well, how do you know that? Well, you know, so-and-so was called to heaven early. Well, who placed that call? <laughs> what do you, you see what I'm getting at? It's like everybody goes to heaven when they die. No, they don't. No, they don't. And there are a lot of people think they're going to heaven because they're good people. And there are a lot of good people in this world. And he says, look, if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. Meaning you will not hear welcome in to heaven. He says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God. Now, again, this isn't the Holy Ghost. He's saying, if so, be that God's life and nature dwell in you. If you're born again and you have his life in you, you're not in the flesh. Now, I know a lot of Christians talk about from time to time, well, I got in the flesh today and I just I just really just said some nasty words when I, you know, something happened. Okay, I understand that concept. I really do. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the difference between being governed by the flesh, being lost and being born again. And he says, you're not in the flesh. You're not born again, but you are in the spirit. If so, be that You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the life, nature, the born again spirit from God dwells, has residence within you. He said, now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, what's the difference between the spirit of Christ and the spirit of God? Nothing. He's talking about the life and nature of God. So what he's doing here, he's drawing uh, a unity, an image of unity between Jesus Christ and Almighty God. And he says, just, he's telling you it's the same life. There's, there's no, you know, born again life from God and born again life from Jesus Christ. It's the same life. And he says, now, if you don't have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, this is, to me, this is really interesting and unique, the way that the Holy Spirit moved for this to be written. Here's why. Because you see, there are a whole lot of people that talk about, oh, I love God, I love God, I love God. And there are a whole lot of people out there that they have all different kinds of names for God. You know, Buddha, Muhammad, you know, Harry Krishna or whatever. But then he brings it, I mean, he, he really narrows the field here when he says, let me clarify this. If you don't have the spirit of Christ, Christ. Meaning, if you have the Spirit of Christ, you have the Spirit of God. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't have the Spirit of God. In other words, if you've rejected Jesus Christ and have not accepted him into your life, <laughs> worship who you want, it makes no difference because you do not have the Spirit of God on the inside. He says in verse 10, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Okay, now this is interesting because... He says, look, if Christ be in you, meaning if you have 
Christ's life in you, if you're born again, he says, your body is dead because of sin. Well, my body's not dead. What are you talking about? My body is dead. Okay, remember what God said to Adam back there in Genesis. He said, the day you eat thereof, you will die. And so Adam, he was fully alive spiritually, fully alive soulishly, if you will, fully alive physically, but he ate. And when he ate, from God's perspective, he was dead. Now let me, let me try to put it in terms we can kind of understand. The moment that Adam sinned, it introduced to his physical being a virus that could not be cured. And that virus continued to destroy his body until, you know, what, 912 years or whatever it was. I mean, he died. He, he, his body finally died. There was a, a TV show I saw here um, a while back, and it was about a lady. Somebody had, like, poisoned her orange juice with this radioactive liquid. You can't taste it. Well, once she drank it, then that radiation was in her, killing her. And <clears throat> I don't remember the exact wording of it was, but, you know, she only had a few weeks. I mean, that was it. She's going to die. There's nothing that could be done. And so it was like, I'm dead. She's still alive, but I'm dead. All right. He says here that if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. All right, your body, your physical body, from God's perspective, is dead. Meaning, the sin virus is at work in your flesh body. You're dying. Now, there can be healing of vision, of broken arms, uh, you know, deafness and things like that. But it's only delaying the inevitable in that the day is coming sooner for some than others. But that virus, that sin virus in your physical body will eventually take over your body. <clears throat> That's it. You, 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 it's done. It's over. And so it's like God is saying, hey, you know, you look at yourself and think things are okay. But no, you're dead. <laughs> Your body is dead because of sin. Not because you committed sin, but because of the sin nature. What I just referred to as a sin virus. That's in you now. And he says, however, there's hope. Your spirit, your born again spirit is life because of righteousness. He doesn't say your born again spirit, your spirit will be life. Or shall become life. He said it is life. Meaning right now. You cannot become any more. Uh, if you're born again. You cannot become any more alive. Spiritually than what you already are. You are the sum total. Of spiritual life. Right now if you're born again. And so it's almost as though he's saying look. You know you got the sin virus. That has just destroyed your body. It, it, you can't fix that. Now, the day's coming, I'm going to give you a glorified body. I'll give you a new one, all right? But for right now, your body's dead. But you're not like the lost people. You have life inside you. And it's spiritual life that has come from me. He says, but if, verse 11, if the spirit of him, God, that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you, if the life of God that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Now, look what he's talking here. If the life of him that raised up Jesus from the dead. How was Jesus raised up from the dead? Well, both spiritually and physically, right? He says, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his life, his nature, his spirit that dwelleth in you. So think of this right now. And I don't understand how this is all going to play out. But right now in you, 
is life, spiritual life. And he's saying, look, don't get upset because your day's coming physically and you're going to just die. I mean, you're going to just stop functioning. You have my life in you right now. And if I raised up my son Jesus Christ from the dead, I will also quicken or bring life to your mortal body by the power, the same power of that life that's in you right now. In other words, think of it like this, that spiritual life in us. That is the life that is going to completely change these physical bodies. What kind of defects do you have right now? Well, you're not going to have those. Because the spiritual life of God in you does not have the capacity to produce physical defects in a body. And so you're more, in fact, you can read about this over in 1 Corinthians. He talks about, you know, the mortal shall be, you know, immortal and so forth. Well, he's saying, look, the life of God on the inside of you, that's the tool he's going to use to give you this immortal body. He'll quicken your mortal body. And he says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Why? Well, it's dead. The flesh and our born-again spirit have nothing in common. Because the flesh has death working in it. Our spirit has life and is life. And he says, so you're not a debtor to the flesh, meaning you are not subject to the control of the flesh. And you don't have to live that way any longer. I don't ever remember hearing that when I was growing up. I don't ever remember hearing somebody tell us, you don't have to sin. Oh, you know, we had plenty of rededication services. Where <laughs> some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. You know, a rededication service, you know, well, rededication is what Christians do. Getting born again is what lost people do. And man, there's people they read rededicated all the time. <laughs> you know, you just wonder what are they doing throughout the week here? <laughs> but he says, look, you're no longer in bondage to the flesh. Well, if I'm no longer in bondage to the flesh, then I don't have to live according to its dictates. All right, what are its dictates to you? What are they to me? Well, let me just create examples. Maybe, maybe my flesh just wants to watch a whole lot of pornography. All right? Well, that's not good for me. It does me a lot of damage. And he says, well, you know what? You have the life of Christ on the inside of you. And because of that, you're not a debtor to the flesh. You don't have to keep watching that junk. I don't. No, you don't. You've got the Spirit of God, that life, that power in you. And so therefore, <laughs> just don't do it. You mean it's that easy? Yeah, it's that easy. You just have, you're so used to giving in to the flesh that you don't fully understand the law of the spirit of life on the inside of you. And so he says, hey, brethren, hey, look, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. Then he gives you a bit of a warning. He says, for if we live after the flesh, you know, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Do you realize he's saying you can put to death everything in you that wants to, you know, drink the booze. You don't have to smoke the dope, do the drugs. You don't have to chase the women, chase the men. You don't have to watch the porn. You don't have to, you, whatever it means, you don't have to. He says, look, <clears throat> what you do is you mortify the deeds of the body and experience the power of God's life on the inside of you. Another way to say that is, it is through the power of God's life in you that you put to death the deeds of the flesh. Because, he says, the body is dead. Well, if it's dead, I mean, look, every one of us in here, we've had a family member or close friend die. That's just how it is. You live long enough, people around you, they start dying. It's sad, and I'm not making light of it. That's how it is. Well, you know what? Maybe they weren't the nicest person in the world. Some families have a, have a Cruella de Vil. In the, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, 
Well, you know, once that person's gone, guess what? They're no longer a problem for you, are they? How many of you remember the episode of Star Trek, the original Star Trek with Harry Mudd? And remember, Harry Mudd had this this nagging wife. I mean, she just would not shut up. And so what he did was create this, this android of his wife. Her name was Stella. And that android would start, Harry, wanga, 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 wanga. And he would just stand there and watch and listen, watch and listen. And then all of a sudden he would say, shut up. And she would go, <laughs> Anybody remember that episode? I'm the only one that remembers that? You guys live a sheltered life. What is it? We need to have a Star Trek marathon, just so you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, he was, it made him feel so good that he could shut up. <laughs> and then, you know, that was his way of... And, okay, do you understand the analogy? Brother Martin, I have no idea. Okay, the flesh is your Stella. <laughs> In other words, you tell it to shut up. You tell it, no, no, no. You're not going to do this. He says, if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. Meaning, okay, here I am as a Christian. If I keep saying yes to the flesh, guess what? I'm facing death. Now, granted, I already know that if I'm lost, I'm facing death. Well, I'm not lost, though. He says, however... But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body. So obviously he's telling me, look, now that you're born again, <laughs> you don't have to live that way. But sadly, a lot of Christians don't seem to be bothered by this concept. Well, why can't I do this stuff? Well, because you don't have to. If God says something is sin, then the power of his life in you is the power that you can say, no, I won't do it. And he says, for as many are... Uh, led by the Spirit of God, meaning His life in them, they are the sons of God. So as I allow myself to live according to who I've become in Jesus Christ, I'm His Son and I mature in that sonship. He says, look, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Meaning, His life in you is Him adopting you into His family and verse 16, the Holy Spirit is bearing with it, witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the Holy Spirit is saying, you're a child of God, you're a child of God, you're a child of God. Okay, praise the Lord, I'm a child of God. Yeah, but what comes with that? It's the power to say no to sin. So what is he saying here so far? Well, to summarize it, I'm no longer, born, uh, I'm no longer lost, I am born again. I no longer have to live by the lost flesh nature, if you will, I can live by the born again spiritual life that I received from God. And it is through that life that I can say no to everything about the flesh. Well, then in verse 26, likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities. All right, what are infirmities? Let's say it like this. All that junk of the flesh that wants to keep controlling my life. All those habits, all those behaviors that are in opposition to who I am in Christ. And he says, the Holy Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Well, what does that mean? It means that likewise, or we have the power to control ourselves and to live according to who we become in Christ. But in addition to that, the Holy Spirit will help us in our battle against those infirmities. For we know not how to pray for, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. What does that mean? All right. Here I am. I'm struggling with, oh, I mentioned the pornography, okay? I'm not struggling with that, okay? <laughs> But to use that as an example, okay, let's say that, that I'm struggling with pornography. It's like, I want to stop. I want to stop. I, well, yes, but the power of God in you, his life. I know, I know, but it's like, I just can't, I just can't. Okay, well then pray about it. I do pray about it, but it just doesn't seem to work. So then maybe you don't really understand how to pray about it. And the Holy Spirit says, 
look, I'm bearing witness with you. You're a child of God. As a child of God, you're not bound to that pornography or the alcohol or the this or the that or whatever, whatever. You're not bound to that. But you're messing up here in your approach to live free from it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you out. You've been praying, oh, God, deliver me. Oh, God, deliver me. Oh, God, deliver me. But you've already been set free. You were born free. Free as the wind blows. <laughs> you were born. And some of you have no idea what I was just making reference to. <laughs> Am I seriously that old? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Thank you, thank you. Okay, you're born free. Meaning, born again, free from that stuff. You're free from it. Why do you keep asking for your father to free you from it? You are free because you have his life in you. But you keep praying the wrong way about it. So I'll tell you what. I'll do this. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Here's what I'll do. If you will just start praying in that language I gave you, then what I will do is help you in this area. I will supply to you the way you're supposed to pray about this. I will dictate it to your spirit. And then as you are praying in tongues, you will be praying the perfect prayer. Because look at this. He says, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to what? The will of God. So I'm saying, Oh God, God, I just can't stop this. I just can't stop this. And God is saying, you're my child. Yes, you can stop it. Don't you remember? Jesus was tempted like as you are, yet without sin. That's who you've become. You can say no. You can condemn sin in the flesh. But God, I just can't stop. I just can't. Oh, God, free me, free me. And God says, all right, Holy Spirit, (laughs) I can't get through to this kid. Take it from here. Holy Spirit says, yes, sir. And so now all, the, all they have to do, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all they have to do is convince me to start praying in tongues. And I start praying in tongues, and then the Holy Spirit, he dictate, dictates to my spirit the perfect prayer according to the will of God for me. So I begin praying in tongues. Now, I don't know exactly what the words are that I'm praying because my understanding is unfruitful. The Apostle Paul shared that in 1 Corinthians 14. But what I am doing is praying according to the will of God. So one way I could be praying is this. Father, I th- and I'm praying in tongues, but here's what God hears. Father, I thank you so much. I'm free from sin. I'm free from sin. I'm free from pornography. I'm free from, I'm free from, you know, fill in the blank. I'm free from it. You set me free. I have your life in me. I've been set free. I condemn sin in the flesh and so on and so forth. And so I keep praying that and I keep praying that and I keep praying that. And eventually the reality of it becomes the reality of the way I live. And he says, and we know verse 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All right, I am the called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? That nobody perish, everybody comes to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's his purpose for all humanity. And so therefore, I pray and I pray, and all these things that I am praying in the Spirit, all these things that the Holy Ghost is delivering through me, they are working together for good in me according to the will of God because I am called according to the purpose of God. I am born again. Okay, now think about this. The Holy Spirit helps me, but he doesn't do for me. So what happens is I pray and I pray and I pray and I pray and then I begin understanding more clearly how that I'm free from this. I mean, I don't have to do this. And I I meditate in the word of God and I see these verses about I've been set free, I've been made free, I've been free, free, free. All, and it's like, yeah, that's me. I'm free. I don't have to keep saying yes. But what if I don't do it? I can keep praying in tongues my whole life. Nothing's going to change. But the Holy Spirit, 
He's doing everything he can to reveal to me, and he's telling me, all right, this is what you need to do. Here's how you approach it. Here's how you stop. Here's how you say no. All right, think of, think of it like this. You know, here's our, our good buddy Guido. And he goes to his doctor. And he says, Doc, oh, Doc, I tell you, I feel lousy. I mean, every day I'm feeling lousy. You know, I'm short of breath. I have no energy. I don't know what's going on. And so, you know, the doctor looks at him and he says, well, well Guido, <laughs> it's because you're 100 pounds overweight. And not only that, you eat too much sugar. You eat too much fatty food. You, you don't get any kind of exercise and you don't drink enough water. So Guido says, well, okay, well, what do I need to do? And the doctor's thinking, oh my goodness, I, I just told you what you... So the doctor says, all right, you need to cut way, way, way back on the fatty foods, way, way, way back on the sugar stuff. You need to uh, get some exercise. You need to eat a balanced diet. You need to start drinking more water. And along with all of this and exercise, lose 100 pounds. Guido says, oh, okay. Well, a year later, Guido shows up at the doctor's office. <laughs> Oh, Doc, I'm feeling so bad. I'm feeling lousy. Oh, Doc, I'm short of breath. I have no energy. I just don't know what to do. And the doctor says, well, did you do what I told you last year? Just, no, no, but I just don't think you're doing a good job. I'm going to go find another doctor. Well, now, is it the doctor's fault? And if Guido goes to another doctor and the other doctor has a clue what he's doing as a doctor, what's he going to tell Guido? Same thing, same thing, same thing. He's just going to tell him the same. Every doctor he goes to is going to be the same answer. The doctor can't do for you. Guido has to what? Cut back on the sugar, cut back on the fatty foods. He has to start getting some exercise. He has to start drinking more water, eat a balanced diet. In other words, he has to live such a boring life. OK, <laughs> but he'll at least live a little bit longer. <laughs> you guys get the imagery. I go to Dr. Holy Spirit. And I begin praying in tongues. He begins instructing me what to do. He begins showing me what to do. Now it's up to me. I can cut back, you know, on the sugar, on the fatty. You understand what I'm getting? I can do that. But if I don't. What can he do? What can he do? Nothing. And see, a lot of Christians seem to have this idea that, well, if I pray in tongues, then God is going to make me change. No, he won't make you change. But he'll help you come to the understanding of how you can change. He'll help you come to the understanding of the power of his life on the inside of you to where you realize, I can stop. See, that's what's happened with me. In that I've learned over the years, well, like I said earlier, I have no excuses. Because I've come to the place of understanding more about who I am in Christ. I'm still learning. But the more that I've learned has taken me to the place of realizing I have no excuses. I can't say, well, I can't help it. I can't say, well, I didn't know better. I can't say, well, I just had a bad day. I, I can't blame it on anything other than I yielded to the flesh. That's just what it comes down to. And emotionally, sometimes it feels easier to just yield to the flesh. But no matter how much that soothes our emotions, we're hurting ourselves. And we don't even know it. You know, have you ever, you ever sat cross-legged so long that your leg goes numb? <laughs> and then, then when you stand up, you know, <laughs> it's a, all right, the one thing you don't want to do is start running up and down steps. Because you'll break things and won't even know they're broken until the numbness wears off. Well, see, <laughs> that's kind of the way it is when we yield to the flesh. We don't realize we're hurting ourselves. It may feel okay for the, for the moment, but it doesn't do us any good. Well, sometimes I just, I just need to vent. 
<laughs> okay, can you let us know like a day ahead of time when this is going to happen? So we can kind of hide. Well, I just couldn't help it. Yeah, you could. I see, here's the deal. As a Christian, on the inside of you, there is a born-again nature conscience Conviction <laughs> says, no, don't. You have to override that. The more you pray in tongues, the more sensitive you become to that conscience. Change is possible for every single one of us. Permanent change is a reality. Getting to the place of saying, I never have to be like that again. One of the best things that we could do is pray, Father, Convict me like crazy. I give you permission to overload me with conviction <laughs> when I'm leaning toward the flesh. Now, you pray a prayer like that, and he's probably going to answer it. <laughs> but, hey, it's for our own good. That's what we need. I, I, you know, think about it. Every single one of us we really do want to be more like Jesus. We really do want to conform more to the image of his glory. All right, well, see, this is part of the process of getting there. We're born again with God's life in nature. The power of that life in us is the power to be everything God has described here in his word. The Holy Spirit will help. He won't do it for us, but he will help us. And praise God for that help. Amen. Please stand. Father, I thank you so much for your word and the revelation that you give us. Father, I thank you for your patience because you put up with a lot from us as we are growing. And uh, Father, we do make a lot of excuses and truth is there are times when we, it's like we try to convince ourselves we couldn't help it when we really know differently. Father, I'm asking you just to keep working with us, and I know you will. I know you will. May we yield to your working in us because you're working in us to will and to do of your good pleasure. May we yield to that constantly. May we come to the place of fully understanding, I have no excuses. I can be everything God has described in his word and, and live that way because that's our potential and there's more joy in that than what we realize. So I thank you for helping us and Holy Spirit, I thank you for helping us in this. Thank you for helping us with our infirmities. And I thank you, Father, for how far along we have come in Christ. I praise you for our, our growth and our maturity. And I thank you that we have not reached the end. There's so much more. And that is exciting, Father, because it means our potential has, we've only begun to tap into it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise you. And Father, again, we just pray for all the, the friends and family members, survivors of that attack down there at that church in Texas. Just continue to minister to all those folks and, uh, and including the family members and friends of the man who did this. Father, I say may there be such incredible reconciliation and restoration. May, may this turn into revival in that region. And Father... From a practical standpoint, I'm asking that, that you would, however you do it, that there would be a flow of finances into that church. There's a lot of damage in that building that needs to be repaired. And Father, with half that congregation having passed on, they won't be giving anymore. Father, I, I just pray for the financial stability of that church. And I also pray, Father, that you'll give that pastor the wisdom, him and his wife, Father, to, to not just deal with the loss of their own daughter, but how 
to be the shepherd he needs to be during this time. Help him through his own loss, him and his wife. Help them through their loss. But then, Father, help them to help the rest through this loss. Father, some people would say, they might say it looks like Satan won, but Father, we say no, no. We're not going to yield to Satan in this one. No, we say Jesus Christ is Lord over Sutherland Springs, Texas, over that Baptist church, and over this whole situation, Father. I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, guys, if you have an offering tonight before you leave, go ahead and bring it up. And um, uh, let's see. Anything you need me to pray with you about, I'll do that too. But you have a blessed remainder of this week. And then we'll see you on Sunday.